Good evening, and thank you for coming to our CARI conversation. This is uh, the first CARI science conversation we've had uh, that did not feature at least one of our staff, but we have a colleague and friend of many of our staff and a really distinguished speaker uh, tonight, uh, Mike St. St. Clemens. So um, let me tell you, because uh, I'm looking at the list and we're up to 150 for what is a stunningly beautiful summer uh, and we are summer evening in the Northeast. And I know some of you are from the Northeast. Uh, to get this many people on a beautiful evening uh, is really remarkable. So thank you to co for coming. Cary Institute, for those of you who don't know us already, um, because I'm looking about, oh, only 45% of you have not attended a Cary event before. Cary Institute is an independent research institute. We're not part of any university or other institution. We are based in Millbrook, New York. Uh, it's about 100 miles north of New York City, right along, you know, headed up north along the Hudson. Uh, we have about 100 staff and we focus our research on large scale ecological or ecosystem level questions in four main areas, uh, urban ecology, freshwater ecology, disease ecology, and forest ecology. I like to say that if you're an ecologist and you're not studying climate change, Climate change will come and get you because it is the driver of all that we do these days. So climate change and pollution combined together are uh, really important parts of our work. This evening's uh, uh, Carry Science Conversation is a joint project with the Millbrook Garden Club. We did a previous uh, Friday night at the Carry, which is uh, in, in the old times, in the, in the pre-COVID times, or as they say, the before times, uh, we used to have Friday night lectures in our auditorium in Millbrook, um, and we had one with Florence Williams, who wrote a wonderful book called The Nature Fix. And uh, knowing Mike's loquacious and intelligent conversation, I have no doubt that this will be as good or better than that one. So with no further ado, let me hand off to Alison Granucci, who will uh, introduce tonight's speaker. Alison is the president of the Millbrook Garden Club. Alison, all yours. Thank you very much. And um, Josh, it's an honor for the Millbrook Garden Club to continue our collaboration with Cary Institute on topics of conservation. And it is my pleasure to now introduce our speaker, Dr. Michael San Clements, author of the book, Plastic Purge, How to Use Less Plastic, Eat Better, Keep Toxins Out of Our Body, and Help Save the Sea Turtles. In the book, he takes on one of the most uh, damaging and beneficial substances in modern life, plastic. And he helps us understand why reducing our plastic consumption can benefit both the environment and our health. A forest soil scientist, Mike is an affiliate of the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research at the University of Colorado Boulder. He also leads the terrestrial instrument science team at NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network, an organization that monitors how ecosystems are changing across the United States. And beyond his research, Mike is interested in science outreach, journalism, and climate adaptation. His articles and photography have been published in the New York Times and several other journals. In his presentation and conversation with Josh, he will tell us how he became a leading advocate for wise plastic consumption, or as he puts it, how he became invested in the good, the bad, and the ugly of plastic. So from the comfort of your own home, please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael San Clements to Carrie's Zoom room. And Mike, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you so much, Allison and Josh, for the nice introductions. And I'm going to go ahead and just um, share my screen and pull up my talk here, and we'll get started. So let's see. Give it a second to work. And hopefully everyone can see this now. So um, I was invited tonight to open with giving a little bit of you know 10 to 15 minutes on how I came to be interested in this topic and write this book. And I always like to start these talks with um, a little bit more about myself. Um, from a personal side. And, um, you know, I live with my wife and daughter in Boulder, Colorado. Um, in our free time, we love to travel and ski. 
And in my day job, which um, has nothing to do with plastic, but I'll talk about how I fell into this um, world of really becoming interested and invested in this topic of plastic and writing a book about it. In my day job, as we mentioned, my personal research um, has always centered around soil science um, and particularly soil carbon. I grew up um, spending a lot of time in the soil. My father owned an excavating company and was a big gardener. So I've been digging foundations and holes and driving excavators and backhoes since I was 12. So progressing to soil science seemed a logical, logical um, you know, extension of that love. And, um, and I also work at NEON, the National Ecological Observatory Network. And I'm really inter interested in um, sensor instrumentation. And this is one of our flux towers that measures the exchange of carbon between the atmosphere and the terrestrial environment. And I, I'm really interested in the concept of network science and open science and serving publicly available and open data and facilitating science for others in the field. It's, it's something I've become very passionate about. And I've also throughout my entire life been, I, I guess the best way to describe it might be a fierce book nerd. I um, have always loved books and journalism and I read everything from nonfiction to cookbooks for the sake of reading them to I love trashy beach novels too. So I've always been really into books and the idea of journalism and been fascinated by it. And um, part of that kind of manifested itself and culminated when I was doing my postdoctoral research in Antarctica in the dry valleys in 2009 through 2011 and spent about six months total um, in the dry valleys studying carbon there. And what I realized when I was there is that there's so many elements of science um, that are really, really fascinating and exciting to me. And we, a lot of scientists spend so much time doing really fascinating, exciting things beyond just the conclusions that wind up in our peer reviewed journal articles. And, you know, like I said, I was always really fascinated by journalism books. And so in this research project, we were flying around the dry valleys and living in remote camps. And so I, I um, reached out to um, Andrew Rebkin, who at that time was um, hosting the New York Times Dot Earth blog. And I, I proposed to him that I would do a sort of narrated slideshow of the life of scientists in Antarctica, featuring photography and, our, and talking about our day-to-day -day lives and, and not just the research and what we're finding itself, but like what it actually takes and like how crazy some of the things that people do to get these data are. And um, he ended up accepting that. And so, in my first sort of attempt at science journalism, I ended up getting this postcard from Antarctica into the um, New York Times. And I felt really lucky about that. And I also so think it gave me this confidence to sort of continue on and, and um, continue trying to do more and more around this, this concept of science journalism and outreach and just trying to make science a little more appealing and fun. And um, we, I did other posts. I, I even wrote things for Backpacker Magazine and all this stuff. And, Around that same time, a group of about 20 of us started this early career ecologists blog, which um, was really active for quite a few years. And we had hundreds of blog posts and many contributors. And it was all young postdoctoral or just out of their postdoc scientists writing about the research and other um, topics around the environment. And that gave me a chance to continue like really polishing my sort of um, writing skills um, from this sort of communication standpoint. And, and during that time, I. I stumbled on um, this sort of um, project by Grist, which is an online environmental newspaper that's kind of fun and snarky. And they had um, this pitch, you know, to sort of bring awareness to a, an environmental topic by daring yourself or creating a challenge for yourself to do and then blogging about that for, you know, a six week period or six posts about something. And so I being kind of naive at the time, thought I'll go ahead and I won't create any plastic waste for two weeks and I'll write about that. And so I, I jumped in and started doing that. And that hit me sort of in a very foundational way. And I put up this article from The Onion right now for two reasons. One, because um, I feel like I love The Onion. I feel like it's off one of the best newspapers in America. Nothing holds a spotlight to, spotlight to society quite like The Onion. And I love this headline of how bad for the environment can throwing away one plastic bottle be? 30 million people wonder. But I put this here too, because at the time I sort of jumped into this dare. It was like 2014 and plastic was sort of just becoming a topic that was more on people's radar. Actually, it was 2013 at that time. And I had a, was really naive with what I was getting into. Like I figured I would write about this and I'd be like, okay, I'll recycle my bottle and I'll bring a bag to the store. And that would sort of be it. And I'd raise some awareness. But then what was happened was I tried to go grocery shopping and I realized I couldn't eat um, without creating plastic waste. And the first time I shopped, I spent 
three hours walking through Whole Foods, just trying to come up with things to eat and ways to fill my cart and, you know, spending $70 on single paper wrapped rolls of toilet paper. And, and it blew my mind. And it was a really learning, you know, deep learning experience. I remember I was thinking like, what can we eat? What can we eat? And I was like, well, we can make quesadillas because I can get cheese and I can get vegetables, but then I couldn't get tortillas. So I was like, I'll make tortillas. And I got home and we were out of baking powder, I think. And then I couldn't find baking powder without a plastic cap. So I ended up with these just like kind of terrible burn tortillas that were an olive oil and flour mess. And it was really kind of a profound experience just to try to shop in our modern store. And it really was like the beginning of an eye-opening experience for me with regards to this topic. And so I continued, um, you know, blogging about this topic and speaking about it in that post. And I did my six posts and I ended with this, with this like kind of um, flippant, I guess, joking comment um, because I'm a dork. And I said, you know, my wife and I both lost weight, which was true. Weird, right? Um, turns out that skipping plastic is like a diet. How about that? The no plastic diet. I'm declaring this um, my idea here and now. The book is in the works. And when I said that, the book wasn't in the works, but it turned out that um, someone from St. Martin's Press had been reading my blog posts and emailed me and was like, we love your blog posts. Here's a um, literary agent and submit a book, um, submit a book idea. And so that's how I fell backwards into this topic, really. And even at the end of that experiment of creating no plastic waste for two weeks, I was still really naive about the scope and the prevalence of plastic and what it means in our lives. And, you know, but at the end of that, I did start to see like my view of plastic started to shift where I felt like these products that didn't have plastic in them were like trying to find where's Waldo, you know, trying to find Waldo in the sea, like where everything was plastic and where's that one product that doesn't have it. And, um, and so diving into this book, like I realized that even after two weeks and shopping and trying to create no plastic waste, I really still had no idea what, what, what it meant for society. And you know, you can start to look at the statistics and you can look at the figures and you can read papers and you can look at this um, image here from one of the ocean gyres. And, and you think about the fact that, you know, models suggest that right now our ocean has 51 trillion pieces of plastic in it, which is more than 500 times the amount of stars in our galaxy. And, and you can look at these, you know, dramatic and crazy photographs like this one of the seahorse of the Q-tip. And, and we can look at, um, you know, this paper from Nature and think a lot about the giant numbers and the millions of tons of ocean, um, you know, plastic that's making it to the oceans from different river basins and all these things. But it's still really hard, even with those numbers, to wrap your, your head around um, what it means right now to think about plastic in, in our society and our lives. And so what I encourage everyone to do when I give these talks is to grab a notebook and a pen and put it next to your bed and pick a day, maybe a day on the weekend or, or a weekday, it doesn't really matter, where you're going to dedicate and tell yourself that you're going to write down every single thing you touch that is plastic for an entire day. And I guarantee you, you will fill like 30 pages of a notebook and it will blow your mind. You'll be so annoyed by the end of the day just writing things down. You can't get much done, so don't do it when you're busy. But um, it's mind blowing. And so I like to put this up here, you know, just this is sort of an example of like the first minute or two of a day. You wake up at 6.15 a.m. Um, you grab your pen to write in your notebook. You've got pen, mattresses, pillows, cell phones, cell phone cables, plastic wall outlets, light switches, toothbrush, toothpaste tube, Q-tips, razor. I don't, I don't actually use those. So this is a little bit of a farce, but um, toothpaste tube cap, shower curtain, water dial, maybe plastic water pipes, shampoo, conditioner, body wash, the bag in a cereal box, the milk jug, your coffee maker, the cream in the container, the cream container, the refrigerator, the flooring you're standing on. And you do this, that's like the first minute or two of a day. And you do this until you go to bed at night and it will blow your mind. And so I, I encourage everyone to take that perspective and sort of really explore for themselves this idea that we have really truly moved from the stone to the bronze to the iron in other ages, and we are living in the plastic age. And, and when you look at this image, another thing that um, strikes me when I, whenever I look at these images, like those three items on the, you know, images on the left, those are like, they look like they belong in a museum. But when you look at that plastic elephant, it just says to you like, this is cheap and meant to be tossed. And, you know, and that's what plastic is and where we're living. And so, uh, I hope, you know, in the rest of this conversation, we can really start to think more broadly about and bring new perspectives to the way you think about plastic, because it is an overwhelming topic and the numbers are so giant and the details uh, can go so deep. But I hope that um, we can sort of 
throughout this topic and questions tonight begin to shift people's view and give them a new perspective for thinking about and framing this in their lives. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Josh. Great, uh, Mike, that was fantastic. A really great overview. And uh, I will try and find some time this summer when my daughter's at home for the two of us uh, to get nice little notebooks and, and see uh, how long it takes for us to go crazy. You know, I think one of the things that really frustrates a lot of people, uh, we already have a question that I did a short answer to, um, is, you know, oh my God, you know, what can I put in the recycling, what can't? And, and you know, it's so complicated and it varies municipality, municipality, uh, it varies whether China's accepting plastics or not. You know, there's so many things that, that determine what we can recycle. Overall, given all that, how much do we actually recycle? I mean, it makes me feel good to look at the bottom. So it's number five, I can put it in. Oh, this one's a styrofoam, it can't go in. Uh, but but what, what does that lead to? And what are the factors that, that limit us? Yeah, so I think the recycling thing is really interesting from the start. And one of the, um, you know, I think it's, it's, it's misleading from the start because we're also used in, to seeing that recycling symbol on everything that's plastic with the number in it, right? And so that sort of makes us think in our heads that it has the recycling symbol, therefore it can be recycled. But the reality is that um, very little plastic is recycled. The numbers vary and depending on which studies you read, you'll see variation. But basically, if you think about of all the plastic that has ever been created, that's about 8,300 million megatons of plastic, metric tons of plastic, I mean, um, about 9% of that has been recycled. And on any given year, we recycle depending on basically depending on whose statistics you're looking at, which country you might be looking at, if it's global or the US, somewhere between around 10% of plastic globally gets recycled each year. So very little. And you know that number is actually decreasing currently. You mentioned China and they're no longer really super excited to take other people's plastic waste. So that has shifted sort of um, the recycling market to really only plastic numbers one and two have like a favorable economic scenario for getting recycled anymore. So it, it's really pretty minimal and it, it can seem a little discouraging to think about. Yeah. We're gonna go back to the days when Whole Food collects, you know, five to make toothbrushes with, right? And, yeah, yeah. and, and uh, we take our plastic bags to CVS because they have a bin for plastic bags and, and so on, right? So, you know, I, I think what's interesting as well is uh, we've all spent a lot of time at home this year. Uh, we've all spent a lot of time doing things that might have been done by others this year. We've spent a lot of time avoiding COVID, right? Um, and wearing masks and initially wearing gloves. How has the pandemic sort of changed our relationship uh, with COVID, with plastic, sorry? Well, uh, yes. So, I mean, that's a great question. And I think, I mean, the number one is basically if you think of plastic as a problem entirely, which I don't, I mean, I think plastic has served a lot of great uses during the pandemic. Like you mentioned, it has kept us safe. Obviously a lot of medical equipment is plastic, a lot of PPE is plastic, but overall our, you know, it has greatly increased plastic use. You mentioned standing at home, like who in the audience hasn't ordered something more from Amazon or more from more takeout in the past year, takeout food in the past year. And I, I dug up some really interesting papers that estimated that um, the world has been using since the pandemic started $65 billion, 65 billion disposable gloves per month and about 3.4 billion face masks per day, uh, um, disposable face masks per day, which can create plastic microfibers and globally like packaging um, for shipping of goods has increased by about 5.5%. And so I think that obviously this is more ways to deal with, but I also think that we need to, you know, recognize that, um, and I think this is a really important thing to do when you're thinking about environmental topics and writing about environmental topics is to recognize that we're all culpable and we needed this and it served, it served us purpose and it helped. And so we have to think about how do we get back to a better place once the pandemic ends. Um, and that's sort of the way I like to think about this, if that makes some sense. Yeah, that, that makes good sense. And, you know, it, it sort of riffs on a, a topic in your book, um, you know, uh, Sergio Leone, uh, you know, uh, the nod to Sergio Leone and, and spaghetti westerns and uh, your classification of plastic as the good, the bad and the ugly. And in, in a sense, that I think is where you're headed. So I'll ask, you know, can you talk a little bit, as you said, not all plastic is bad plastic. And if those plastic line masks 
prevented you know a couple million COVID cases. That's uh, a remarkable thing. Uh, but but what's the good? What's the bad? What's the ugly? And why are they good, bad, and ugly? Yeah. Um, yes. And so I think this is something that when I was uh, I'll just step back a little bit and say that when I was writing the book, I I feel like the good, the bad, and the ugly was a framework. Because when you get to a problem that's so big and the numbers are so big and it's something like I mentioned that we, you know, you can take a notebook and fill 30 pages of how many times you use it a day. It, the problem is quickly overwhelming if you don't start to break it down, at least for me. Oh, yeah. And so like, I need to go ahead and start to, you know, break these down. And so I think the first thing we have to acknowledge is that there is good plastic, right? Like we wouldn't be having this conversation over Zoom without plastic. We wouldn't probably have vaccines for COVID, right? Like we wouldn't have been able to talk to family members we couldn't see. We wouldn't have a lot of green energy solutions and advances in technology and medicine. So I think that it's really important to, to start to think about these big things and that, and like look at, at the, the pie of plastic, if you will, and say like, what is the good and, and what percent might that be? And can we carve that off and set it aside and start to think about now, how do we, how do we break, you know, chip away at improving these other problems and reducing the other plastics. Right. And I think of the bad plastic as um, sort of the plastic that might be reused again and again. You might use it a bunch of times, but it might be introducing some chemicals into your body that are endocrine disrupting, which you might not want. So like the classic example could be like a water, a plastic water bottle and cook or cooking food in plastic, right? Um, we all have heard of BPA and, you know, and the statistics say that, you know, 90 over 90% of adults have BPA in their urine at any given point in time. There's a great quote from um, someone writing on the topic saying that if you don't have BPA in your bloodstream, you're not living in the modern age. And so I think of those, I think of those as sort of the bad plastics where they might be actually contributing to some sort of health effects like those ones we see like early onset puberty in children and things like that or birth defects or, or cancers or obesity. And so then I think of the ugly plastic is exactly what you put up on the screen here. It's the plastic that you tend to see littered, you know, that bag in the tree or that bottle on the shore, that plastic fork. And, and it, the ugly plastic also tends to be the single use plastic, that plastic that on average someone will possess for less than 12 minutes, even though it's going to persist for millennia. And we don't really know exactly how long because no one's been a lot, <laughs> we haven't been, plastic hasn't been around that long. So it's all still out there, um, unless we've incinerated. Um, so, that's what I think of as the ugly plastic. And that's about the ugly plastic, that single use plastic is about 50% of the plastic that's produced on the planet every year, which is an astounding number to think about. And it, and it goes, I mean, we, we, we put something in a little plastic bag at the market and we bring it home and we throw it out and then the food is gone in a day and the plastic is gone in a millennia. Right, it's exactly right. like that tomato you see wrapped in plastic and it's like, yeah. Does anything make less sense? And those two timelines are not, <laughs> they're, they're not, not aligned. And maybe that timeline of, you know, I'm, I am typing on a plastic uh, computer uh, keyboard and, and I'll use it for maybe two years. Maybe that timeline is a, a better trade off for good versus ugly. You know, um, interestingly, for those of us of a generation, we remember that, you know, scene when Walter Brooks was in the graduate talking to Dustin Hoffman and said, I have only one word the future. <laughs> Only one word, plastics. Yeah. And that says to me, right? So I was eight, so I wasn't watching The Graduate at eight, but you know, I watched it a few years later. Yeah. But that says to me that this problem is relatively recent, right? Because if in 1967, and the film was set, I think in 63, um, and so in the early 60s, we were saying plastics is the future, that suggests that plastics weren't the present. Exactly. And so, you know, how did plastics become so prevalent? What's happened? What are, you know, what got us here and how do we get out of here? Yeah, so this was, um, this is a really fascinating topic and one that I became really interested in in writing. It was probably for me um, in writing this book and, and exploring this topic was the most fun part and like interesting. And there's all these convergences that happened to sort of get us, but. It, What's really interesting is the first sort of whack at creating a plastic occurred um, when a billiards company in New York offered $10,000 to anyone who could come up with a replacement for ivory and billiard balls. And I think there is like a huge irony there in this. I don't think actually, I think it was the cost of ivory that drove this, not 
you know, elephant con conservation per se, but like there's still an irony there that like using less ivory is what create, like sort of kick this whole thing off considering that um, all of the environmental problems we see plastic causing today. And you know, a bunch of things happened from there, but like the, I see World War II as sort of the next big step in um, the transition from not much plastic to plastic. And basically what happened was there is very, very little plastic being used in this country or in any country prior to World War II. But World War II really kicked off sort of the need for plastic. And you can see in this picture here, um, like all the nylon in, in these chin straps and in parachutes and in all these helmet covers. And, and um, even, you know, people say there is plastic in, you know, the atom bomb. And, and so like all these different wartime products needed plastics. And so we really globally went from a situation where there is almost no plastic producing capacity to a globe where there was a ton, you know, many millions more tons of plastic producing capacity in a short time due to this war. And so when the war ended, what happened was suddenly there was no need for these products anymore. The wartime products weren't needed, but there was all this plastic producing capacity. And so people wanted to continue running these factories. So what happened was a bunch of businessmen in this country got together and formed something called the Society of Plastic Engineers. And basically, in a nutshell, their goal was to find a way to use this plastic, um, this plastic, you know, capacity, plastic generating capacity, and sell the public on the idea that plastic was the future and that plastic products were the future. And so they did this through a whole series of like expos around the country where plastic products and futuristic plastic products. They even went so far as to create a house where everything inside the house was plastic that would go to these, some of these expos um, and sort of sell people. And there was actually, it's really interesting. Um, there was a lot of pushback sort of on this concept at first, but it, over time and, and around the same time, you see a lot of these ads, which are really crazy to look through. Like that is a really weird ad. <laughs> like the baby can't breathe, it's wrapped in plastic. It's just weird and kind of creepy. And, um, but there's a lot of these and they're fascinating to look back on, but it was sort of this like this push to sort of get people to transition to plastic, which really kicked it off. And then obviously there's, you know, there's just the simple fact that plastic is cheap, it's durable, it's buoyant. It can be made into any shape, any color, and, you know, it's easy to produce. And so it's sort of, um, a miracle product, but also those those characteristics also sort of lend it to be what you could think of as um, like the pinnacle of litter, <laughs> you know, the evolutionary pinnacle of litter. <laughs> yeah. I'm muted. There we go. Um, my dog was barking, so I didn't think all of you needed to hear her bark. Um, that makes a lot of sense, and and it's a really interesting history. I mean. As somebody who spent more than half my adult life doing conservation in Africa, the the ivory uh, the ivory substitute is something that that I knew about and always resonates. Um, it's it's something good turning into something bad, right? Uh, in yeah, a really big way. And it's actually I've come to really begin to think of plastic a little bit as an invasive species. Like there's nothing inherently wrong with it, right? It, it's just there's too much of it in the wrong place, and it's too good at what it does. Almost. And and so that gets me to my next question. I, you know, there are so we've got some great Q and A. So we'll we'll make sure we leave some time for that. But there are a whole bunch of interesting advances in plastics uh, and plastic technology. Because one of the problems with plastic is it doesn't degrade. Another problem is we use oil to make it, um, and so it's part of the fossil fuel economy. Um, are there technologies coming out that, that are going to help solve the problem so that if something gets into the waste stream, if it gets out of the waste stream as microplastics and it ends up in the ocean, it might not be there forever? Yeah. So there's there are a bunch of things I, I would say that are all still quite nascent, right? And even if we look at some of the older bioplastics, bioplastics still represent like less than 1% of plastic, right? About one tenth of one plastic that's produced. So very small. And like you mentioned, they are they are made by oil. And there's some really fascinating work, um, which I think has a lot of potential, which is work looking at returning plastic back to fuel oil or back to a feedstock, which can create new plastics which don't have to be down cycled. So plastic, unlike a you know glass or a tin can, can't just be used over and over and over and over again, right? And so it gets down cycled. But there are when you turn them back into fuel products or turn them back into some of these clean feedstocks, there's the potential to do more recycling and almost create that like infinite plastic loop. 
The problem is these are still, and that maybe it's not a problem, but the reality is, I guess one should say, is that these are still very young and difficult to scale and they're new technologies, but that doesn't mean they're not going to be scalable, right? And it's right. exciting that people are working on these. And I, I, you know, we talked about this for a moment the other day, Josh, is I have think of like, there's a lot of um, potential for using these in places where we lack infrastructure for recycling and we rack, lack infrastructure for even powering homes and cooking, but there's a lot of plastic waste. And maybe I've always had this view of like vision of like this nonprofit that would allow people to like clean up the environment in exchange for fuel and cooking oil and power and um, sort of that way. And then there's also new composting methods coming online, like um, some French researchers, as well as people at um, University of California, Berkeley, I believe have started developing new methods where they're adding like tweaked enzymes basically into plastic and into the composting process, which allows plastics to be breaking down entirely in like, you know, much shorter time frames and not creating microplastics plastics like you mentioned that persist. And then there's all these other things like the idea of, um, you know, like composting and that, but also like mushroom packaging, like Ikea has signed on to do that, as right. well as things like um, just not using it. Simple things right. like Maybe we don't need a straw replacement. Maybe we just don't need a straw. Right. And, and there are people who do, and there are very few of them, right? And so we can make bendable metal straws or, or silicone straws or, you know. Pasta straws. <laughs> you know. Um, but, you know, I think the mushroom packing, just so people know, that is packaging. You can see the upper left corner of this picture. That is packaging made out of mushrooms, right? So yeah. it's, using a, it's using a biological material that then gets broken down. And, and you know, I, I think that this idea of, you know, we are in the, in the, in the questions, there are a lot of things about, you know, questions about reuse versus recycle versus reduce. And clearly we have to start with reduce, right? Because it's everywhere, right? Um, yeah. But, you know, I think one of the interesting things, I mean, we were talking the other day and you said that 8% of all fossil fuel is used to plastic. And so that's astonishing as a number. But what happens, what happens if we really get to a net zero economy and we get rid of 80%, 90% of the fossil fuels that we are now burning for energy? Um, does that make fossil fuels wildly expensive, which will reduce plastic? Or do we have a glut of fossil fuels and plastics, which are cheap anyway, get much more, you know, you, there's a bigger market for plastics and people are pushing harder to make plastics because what else are we going to do with all this oil? Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think we've, you know, there, there's, we saw a little bit of that because plastics can also be, be made with, you know, natural gas byproducts, not just the oil, right? And fracking led to a little bit of a push to sort of create more plastics and create more plastic products because there was this availability, right? So I, I think it could go either way. I like to think that what will happen is you will see these um, larger energy companies transition to a um, transition to a revenue stream where they're making money off of green and renewable things so that they're not pushing for the for these other things which are causing problems and that's where I like to imagine we will go <laughs> you know I have to hope <laughs> yeah. yeah all right well so I wanted to make time for questions we got some great questions there are a bunch uh, that basically say look we keep pushing the problem to consumers right? And 20 companies make more than half the plastic in all the world, right? Uh, and I don't know whether, I mean, Helen Suter who, who said that, I'm not, I'm not going to verify whether it's correct, but I think in principle, she's right. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's a, a finite number of corporations who make most of the plastic, and it's seven and a half billion people who use it. Why aren't we focusing on regulatory practices, on, on changing the way companies are charged, Increasing the cost of plastic so people will make reusable items rather than one-off, one, you know, single-use items. Is there a, a movement there? Is it already happening? Uh, what's the constraint there, and why don't we focus on corporations? Well, I think there there is a lot of that movement, and it's this idea of like sort of extended extended producer liability is one way it's referred to, and that's sort of the concept like you brought up of of maybe we push the onus back on and the cost back on the producers of this waste to deal with it. And what's fascinating is I believe Nestle Waters, which is obviously not a small company, has has sort of begun to buy into this idea, right? And so I think that there is a hope that we will push this way. And I also, you know, we haven't touched on this too much yet, but I also think this concept of like 
a lot of the things that we're making in plastic are going to be made with some other material. So there's a chance for whoever is making with one material to be the people who step in to, to solve the problem, right? And they're already probably familiar with that market to some degree. If you're making coffee cups, you can probably make a different kind of coffee cup or what have you. Um, so I think that that coupled with the extended producer liability concept and the fact that I think it's hard to, I, I would be hard pressed to say that this problem has not become more and more like notable in society. Like it's, everyone is aware of it. Like, you know, it's like, daughters are in, she's in elementary school and they talk about this stuff, you know, and like, but we didn't, when I was, you know, it just seems like people are very aware. And I always tell, you know, parents like tell the kids when I speak at schools to just make their parents feel bad. Cause that's a great way to make force change. If I yes, we call that the nag effect. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, my 15 year old got us off plastic straws like three years ago. Yeah. And it was, it was her driving and she makes sure that before we get in the car, there's a metal straw in the car. Should she want one? And you yeah. know, all these things. So yeah, kids are really good at that. There's a lot of questions about single use plastic. I think you've gotten the point across that 50% of the plastic is bad plastic. Most of that is single use plastic. And, you know, there are two sort of strains of questions, one of which is, so what are the ways we reduce it? And the second strain is, is the reason there's so much of it is it's wildly cheap produ to produce. And so the marginal, essentially the marginal cost of putting something in a plastic bag is nothing. And so the, the producers and the consumers don't really care because it's not an economic uh, issue. Uh, it's a pollution issue. Yes, it's wildly cheap um, and it's so cheap. And, but I think, um, you know, I used to be really, and I think a lot of people when I first, when you first think about like 50% of the plastic is, you know, that's going out there and that we see littering and like a lot of these from is single use plastic. That's like, a, at first it hits you as kind of like a wildly depressing statistic. But, um, but the more I've thought about this um, over, over the years, like it's actually become the brightest spot of hope I see. And that is because when I think about like all the single use plastics and what they actually are, it's like things like, it's like a fork or a cup or like a milk jug or like a, right? And you start to think about those things and none of them are like new inventions or really technologically like difficult to reproduce. And then you start to like think back to like this history thing of like the sixties, like people had soup, people had forks, people had bags, people had all these things. Like they had washing machines and cars, like life besides technology was fundamentally very similar. Like a lot of the single use plastics were just, and there's a really fascinating um, exhibit in one of the airports in California, it might be San Francisco, where they have a bunch of these products in glass and cases, but walking through this fascinating, but that gives me a lot of hope because you start thinking about these things and you're like, it's not that hard to like replace a lot of these and do away with 50% of that plastic, which is ending up and kind of useless. Those are the easiest ones to actually replace without like coming up with novel miracle solutions, you know? Um, so that actually gives me a tremendous amount of hope. And it's like the, what I see as the bright spot in this whole story. Right. Um, and so there are a couple of comments um, sort of in response. Uh, Patricia Townsend said, you know, in the state of Washington, they just passed the best legislation in the nation on banning single use plastic. So I think one of the things you really have to focus on is, is legislation. And, Absolutely. And, and, you know, there's the, there's the regulatory approach. And then there's the, the, the full cost approach. Mm -hmm. which is if we actually paid what it costs to dispose of a plastic bag uh, up front and the ecological impacts of trying to get it out of those plastic gyres in the ocean up front, that plastic bag would no longer cost three cents, it would cost 30 cents. And everybody would bring re you know, reusable bags because it would be so, you know, if you went and went shopping and went two or three places, you're spending two or three bucks a day mm -hmm. on, on bags, right? And so exactly. it would very quickly get people doing it and some of these are like such simple behavior changes too like i i, we, I mentioned this the other day like i think um of like when we go grocery shop for produce like how many of us are trained to like pick up a carrot or an apple and put it in a plastic bag and put it in your cart but like i always say like you can put an apple in your cart and it doesn't explode like without the bag like it's fine <laughs> you can do that <laughs> like it's totally cool and like similar like i think to um like if you walk down the you know the shampoo soap like there was no such thing as body wash even when I was in college, I don't think, you know, and now there's like all these bottles, like bars of soap are pretty simple. Um, so there's a lot of these really simple sort of solutions too that um, I think, you know, that are just, people just have to be like, oh yeah, we already know how to do that. Like that's a right. simple path forward. Yep. Yeah.
Well, that's good. Um, so there's a question in here, it actually rests on something that you and I have already discussed, which is the idea of mining landfills for plastic. And because it's made out of, of, of fossil fuels, um, do you think that, that the, well, so the, the burning of and or conversion of plastics into something else from a landfill is something that we'll see in the future? So some of that exists to date um, a little bit. And then, you know, that idea, there's people, there's talk of, and some of these companies that are interested in this idea of, you know, converting plastic back to feedstock have also considered the idea of, is it possible to mine plastic, mine land? All right, you said feedstock? Yeah, like a fuel or a feedstock for future plastics. So oh, thank you. And not to, not to give it to our cows and go. Not to give it to our cows, like a feedstock for the next round of plastic. Um, And so, yeah. <laughs> I don't think anyone's tried that one yet, the cow one, but we can, we can but, uh, um, but yeah, like, uh, I think, so, you know, that's something that I think we could see the, you know, the life cycle analysis is a big thing when you start thinking about some of these questions and you have to really think if you're digging up plastic and incinerating it, um, then you have to really start thinking about like, well, like how effective are we at scrubbing what's coming out of the incinerator? And are we introducing like dioxins or something into the environment? And like, what is the true cost of doing that? And I think um, that brings up a really good point that you that you brought up the other day too when we were chatting, Josh, is like, when we think about these things, like that idea of like the full concept of the life cycle and that life cycle analysis is so critical when you start thinking about these things and like looking at what you're reading and thinking like, are they encapsulating everything? That's key, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I think, again, it's interesting. Um, uh, DARPA, the Defense uh, Research Program, brought us the internet. Sorry, Al Gore. Um, and that is also, I mean, there's a Navy ship. I remember reading a couple of years ago that they were looking at us uh, on this, you know, having incineration uh, potential on board so they didn't dump their garbage overboard. And they were figuring out just the questions you asked. How do we burn it at a temperature that gives us efficiency, gets rid of dioxins? But again, I think, you know, it's an interesting thing because of course, if you're on an aircraft carrier, you got a couple thousand people on an aircraft carrier, they're producing a lot of waste. And mm -hmm. some of that is plastic, some of that's, you know, biological, but it's waste. And mm -hmm. if we can find ways to use the energy in that waste, yes, it still releases the carbon, right? So we got another problem. Long-term, it's not gonna be a solution, but maybe short-term it would be. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, the other questions, uh, uh, Jess, F, who I think is a college student, said, you know, how do I get my college to get away from single-use plastics? And right, I've started talks with the dining center. They use 100% plasticware and disposable dishes, quote, due to COVID, end quote, this year. Um, but there are certain ideas that, you know, are stronger there. They don't really understand the problem. And, and you know, I assume that the answer is slow, painful education. Yeah, so I would recommend to Jess that I had an amazing experience where I gave um, two years ago, right before COVID, I mean, yeah, just before COVID, maybe a couple months before, like it all kind of hit, I gave a talk at Bates College in Maine, and they have a sustainability program there that's run by the student body, and they have completely basically managed to convince the university to eliminate all single-use plastic from all their dining halls and everything, and um, and do all these other great, like really progressive things. So, um, and they have a big club and they have like an Instagram page and a Twitter page and they're always putting out information. So I would recommend that if you're interested in starting something like that in your college, like reach out to those students who run that because they like transformed it. It was amazing. Yeah. Right. And and one of one of our, our uh, participants, uh, you know, talks about bringing back the seltzer man, but also, you know, I, I lived in England you know, what, 20 years ago now, 25 years ago, it's been a while, uh, but we still got milk deliveries in glass bottles, mm -hmm. right? And they had metal, metal tops. On. There wasn't a single piece of plastic. And is it, is it an economic issue of, of the collecting, washing, recycling glass and the cost of moving heavy, you know, heavy loads of glass around that makes glass less uh, popular for, uh, con you know, beverage containers? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it is heavy to move around, right? Um, we actually, though, are able to get, like, we get milk delivered to our house in glass, actually. You can do that here. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah. You know, um, so it's possible, but I mean, it, it is what you have to pay a little bit, right? And it's not available everywhere. And I think, you know, transporting things is heavy. There are clever ways, and, you know, milk is a trickier one, but um, to, like, eliminate some of those transportation and, and bottling costs. There's a company that I spoke with 
a little while ago that was in Florida, then moved to Colorado. And what they're doing is um, really clever where they've created, taken like all of our cleaning products. Cause right now we, we think about, you go to the store and you see like all these cleaning products, like they're in a plastic bottle and they, they're liquids in there and it's expensive to ship. They take a lot of room, there's a lot of plastic. And they've basically created them into like a, t a tablet that you drop into tap water. And then you can reuse the same wow. bottle again and you don't need to transport the weight. You don't need to recreate the plastic bottle. So like that type of thing, um, while it wouldn't work for milk, I think like there's a lot of places in like our, you know, our um, cycle that you could make improvements like that. Right, right. Somebody wants to know what your thermos is made of, Mike. This one is um, stainless steel. It's a vacuum. Okay. Yeah, right. actually the water bottles are interesting. Um, they, um, water bottles are interesting because if you read a little bit about like, you know, BPA plastic free water bottles, the BPA free typically just means that they're using a different something for the same purpose. So like either BPS or BPF, which tend to be like less well studied. And um, in the few studies there are tend to show more endocrine disrupting potential than BPA. So I recommend like if you're if you're going to go for a water bottle, like skip the BPA free and just go for a metal one. Metal or glass. Your glass, yes, exactly. Right. I'm, and, I always and, you know, I think we get a bunch of questions coming up in the QA about things like, you know, uh, the company up in Albany uh, called Boxed Water, right? That that we use it. I'm very proud we use it at our events, and it's great for lots of reasons. One of which is in paper. The mm -hmm. other of which is that it's it stores much more efficiently because it's square. Yep. And people are wondering. I get a, there's a question. You know, could we use that? you know, for shampoo or for milk or things that, you know, or, or, or cleaning agents that are, you know, are now sold in plastic, right? You mentioned the issue of, of liquids and going for powders and or for concentrate powders is really a great idea. And if that takes off, that'd be great. But could we use paper containers? Are they robust, sufficiently robust to be used where we are now using plastic and you put that paper container in the shower and it doesn't fall apart? So oftentimes those paper containers are lined with a plastic lining okay. um, and that's what keeps them. And you can search, like this is one of those things where it's like, you really have to like, it's a really like sort of where you live and what products are available where you shop. Cause like, you know, like a loom, like canned foods like typically are lined with plastic but like some aren't some are lined with other things and new plastics and like Campbell's is trying to move that way but it's really this is one of those situations where you have to really look what's available and like what you like and and then like google those products and try to find the one that's on your shelf that is plastic free and some of them are most of them aren't um so yeah that's one of those things of like plastic hides in a lot of places where you don't expect it and you're like oh oh yeah darn you know right. but but as you said earlier i think you know there is there are the easy things to get rid of and then if we got rid of the easy things we'd be halfway there exactly and that's right. a big, and i think that's question. worth repeating you know a lot of people there's a lot of discussion about recycling in the q a and it would be good to go through number one what proportion of plastic could theoretically be recycled Number two, what proportion of it actually is recycled? And number three, why is so little it recycled? Yeah, I mean, so theory, theory, theoretically, it could all be downcycled unless it was something where it's a product, like children's toys are really hard to recycle as a good example because they tend to be like a mix of many different types of plastic that not can't necessarily be, you know, recycled together. So that, so there's, but theoretically you can recycle the plastics, right? Um, only about 10% gets recycled really. And the reason plastic recycling is hard, which I was really fascinated by when I learned this is like, you think about like recycling things like glass or tin, copper, like metals and glass, right? They're easy to separate. Like uh, some things are magnetic, some things aren't magnetic. Some are really light, some are really heavy. Some have an inherent color like copper, you know? Um, and they have different, really different melting temperatures and some of these things, right? And so those- And, and they're valuable, right? Yes. And aluminum and can valuable. is valuable. Right? And they could be separated easily with like automated processes. But when you think about plastic, like any plastic can basically be any color. They almost all have the same specific density. They aren't magnetic. Some aren't magnetic, some aren't. They're buoyant, so you can't float some and not, like, so it becomes very hard to separate in an automated fashion plastics one through seven. And especially in this country and the way our sort of 
recycling infrastructure is, is, is that it tends to be at a very like local municipal level. So a lot of times the, the things that you might use to separate these in automated fashion or the, you know, the, the person power you need to come in and do this is expensive and municipalities can't afford it. So separating plastic becomes very difficult. And that is one of the great challenges to recycling, to recycling plastic is that cost and that difficulty. Okay. Um, so that makes good sense. Um, so again, it gets back to avoid using it if you can uh, and avoid it, avoid it, I mean, reduce, reduce, reduce. Um, another question, uh, I mean, there was some pushback on the burning plastics, which I think we would agree with that it's, you know, it's energy inefficient and you have to spend energy to make the plastics, you have to spend energy to collect and to burn them. It's not a great idea. Some things like medical waste are incinerated for other reasons, right? Yep. Yeah, um, I think, you know, I think when we think about this problem, like it's some solutions might make sense early. And like, as we if we start to think of this as like one, say we were to redo everything, right? I think some solutions might make sense for a while as you transition to better things, right? Like, I, w I don't think of these things necessarily as like bad, good, bad, good always, right? Like I think when you're talking along those lines too, there's like sort of a gradient where we have to think and plan and like, there's ideal and not ideal. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, there's a lot of questions about you know corporate responsibility, greenwashing. So you know, Mattel has said they're going to take back old toys and either re redeploy them, fix and sell them, or or fix and give them away to kids who need them, or 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 dispose of them properly, right? And you know, are we right to be cynical when corporations uh, start to try and do better? Or do you think there actually is a movement where those corporations will eventually get better? I mean, I, I'll do a shout out. I, I, and I think Harney Tees, who all, all honestly, Harney is a sponsor. Uh, but I know that they think really hard about every part of their process. And, you know, their, their tea comes in glass bottles with metal tops, just like it used to, right, when I was a kid, mm -hmm. right? Uh, things, you know, were bottled, uh, literally, um, and, and they had metal caps. I mean, uh, so are we, are we so, uh, is it good to be suspicious or can we actually embrace it and think that there are some companies out there really trying to do, do well by doing good? I think we need to, like as consumers, do our, you know, be thorough and do our due diligence and, and read between the lines and, and do the research. But I don't think we want to approach it. And this is partly just my personality. <laughs> um, I don't think we want to be too cynical because then I think we'll never get anywhere, right? Um, so I think we have to, you know, give these companies a chance. And will all of them do amazing things? Absolutely right. not. But will some? And should we? And if we start as consumers rewarding the ones who are, perhaps that will help bring the other ones along, right? Well, and whether and, or not they're doing it because they're greedy or because right. they are kind. Ultimately, as long as we get somewhere better, maybe that doesn't always matter. I don't know. It's a, right. <laughs> it's a, and, you know, I think Patagonia is a great example where Patagonia started out making polypropylene sweaters, mm -hmm. which and, and we all were really happy because our our plastic Coke bottles became sweaters. And, you know, this was fantastic. And they became blankets. And then we discovered that when we put them in the washing machine, they released microplastics. And, you know, there were these balls that you could have put in, but they didn't catch them all and filters, but they weren't so good. And Patagonia is now moving back to natural fibers and wool and cotton, and they're recycling and reselling. They have a, a very active re, re, you know, reuse, re, you know, remarketing of used Patagonia uh, clothes that they'll take, if they're in decent condition, they'll take them back. And I don't think I'm cynical about that. I think Yvonne Chouinard is serious and is uh, putting his, his business where his mouth and, and the whole idea of the B Corp, right? which, uh, and a lot of these B Corps, these are corporations, for those of you who don't know, that put their environmental responsibility and their corporate responsibility as part of their bottom line. And so if you invest in them, you may not get quite as good a return, but you know you're getting a return from a company that cares, right? And is open and transparent to their shareholders about what they're doing to make the world, if not a better place, at least a less bad place. Mm -hmm. I, so I, I think that's really important. Um, on the microplastics, I mean, we've got research going looking at the uh, convergence of microplastics and novel pollutants that Emma Rosie, who's done all the work on novel pollutants, is starting to see microplastics as potentially a, a strong attractor for those novel pollutants and amplifying their impacts. Are there other things happening with microplastics and 
you know, filtering them out, reducing them. Is that, is, is the filtering out part of it, why we don't get so much plastic around the United States and there's so much around Asia, right? How does that work? I mean, I think the, um, the microplastics thing is really interesting. And the whole like, pla I feel like when we think about plastics in the plastic environmental, like sort of life cycle, there's a paper, I think in environmental science and technology, or, and then another one, science that were just a few years ago talking about like, the gaps and sort of our understanding of like the plastic cycle in the environment. And there's still so much we don't know. Like you talked about these pollutants. We're just learning that like, you can joke that like it's everywhere, but it's literally, it's in rain, it's in snow, right? Right, like it's, it's, salt. In, it's in salt. salt, it's literally everywhere. And like, there's still so much to learn about like how it moves through soils, like you might come in, how it moves through water and what it attracts. And there's so much to learn there. Um, and I think, you know, we need to, this idea of like how it binds the pollutants and how it moves. I still think we're under trying to get that big picture. And then when you get to like, um, but like the onset of you, that, you mentioned that Southeast Asia, like it's really like the river basins are really what drives it. And like, if you look around, like in, it has to do with sort of the infrastructure for just, you know, cleaning up and trash cans and just- right. And we, we put most of our garbage into landfills Yep. that are relatively well regulated so less stuff gets out into the rivers right but what make but then you know you can also look at that and then take that um i think that figure is really fascinating from that paper because then you can think about it again and like the ocean is a global resource right and yep. that plastic doesn't stay put and it doesn't matter what river basin it came out of so i i think it starts to you know it starts to make you think like do we need to move towards a global like treaty on plastic like i would love i think we do right <laughs> yeah. So we're coming towards the end of our hour, and I want to just say 97% of you said you'd pay more uh, for everyday items to avoid using plastic. There were some really smart answers in the Q&A that weren't just questions, but said, yeah, right, guys, it's a real trade-off. If you have lightweight plastic for Coca-Cola bottles, you're not using as much fossil fuels to move them around. And so what's the trade-off? And the answer is, yes, there's a trade-off. Right. And so I, I'll just say, if you haven't read Mike's book, get a copy and read it. Um, that's the shameless plug. Um, <laughs> but I'll do that for you. Um, it's a really great book and it's really useful and it helps us think about these things. But also be mindful. Right. In the end, living a better life environmentally is being mindful. It is thinking about what you do. It is thinking about whether you turn on the air conditioner or you open your windows. It mm -hmm. is simple stuff uh, that's going to help get us further along. Uh, I will applaud Mike's comments about not being cynical and about actually supporting companies that are trying to do the right thing. And Mike, I'll give you the last words for your advice, but I can't tell you how much I've appreciated your engagement today and really appreciate uh, your passion. Mike is a serious you know, PhD ecologist, right? This is a sort of a started as a hobby. Um, and it's clearly become a passion and part of your life. And, you know, I think uh, there aren't enough of us ecologists who actually get this engaged in our, in our work and, and, and solutions to problems in the environment. I know carry scientists are very good at that and are well known for that, but I applaud you and our colleagues around the world who are really getting out of their labs and getting out of the field and starting to really help us answer these thorny environmental problems. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that, Josh. And I, I would just end by saying, um, you know, do that, do that experiment where you write down every time you touch, touch plastic for a day, sometime this year, I, do it with your kids or, or, you know, your partners or spouses or friends. It's, it, it is really, truly eye-opening. Right. And I think you're right. One other person, at least, so you can compare your notes. Yeah. And so that you don't get, they can call you out when you start to get bored and not write stuff down yeah, yeah, yeah. after an hour. <laughs> or post it on your Instagram account, right? Um, so your friends can keep you honest. Yeah. Anyway, thank you so much. Uh, we had, you know, close to 200 participants, which on a day like today is just absolutely phenomenal. It's getting dark out now. So go out and enjoy the, the last of the, the nights. I'd like to thank Alison Granucci, the president of the Millbrook Garden Club and the Millbrook Garden Club for co-sponsoring this. Uh, you know, the two we've done together have both been remarkable. And so let's do more. Uh, I'll thank, uh, uh, you know, Millbrook Garden Club again for helping sponsor this. Uh, let me remind you that the next Carry Science conversation, it's in the, the chat, is June 24th. And we're going to have some of our uh, recently retired scientists really focusing on the way science has helped guide the recovery of the Hudson River. And it's a positive story. It's a happy story. 
Uh, there are still problems, but we're solving many of them. For those of you who have uh, kids age 12 to 18, as I do, we are going to be doing a virtual art and science camp uh, that's going to focus on botanical exploration. It's July 12th to 16th. Um, and uh, sorry, July 5th to 9th, we'll focus on botanical exploration. 12th to 16th will be about the wonderful world of birds. Um, I'm going to try and get an old friend and former postdoc of mine who's now head of the Cornell Labs of Ornithology, see if he, we can twist his arm to, to show up as a guest speaker. Um, the artist, Tara Waltz, who again, truth in advertising, a former student of mine, uh, will be uh, hosting it this year. And so that's, you know, I think we looked at our, our camps and we decided the art and science camp was the only one that we absolutely had to do virtually. We are also tired, I'm sorry, of this, right? So again, thank you, those of you who share my Zoom fatigue for staying on to the end, all 132, 131. You're dropping off, so we'll say goodnight. Thank you again, and see you all on, uh, uh, you know, at the next uh, Carry Science Conversation on June 24th. Uh, Mike, again, thank you so much. Allison, thank you. And Laurie and Leslie, who make this look easy, you guys do a great job. Thank Have you. a good night, everybody. Bye-bye.